Here we go on this Wednesday, July the 28th in the year of our Lord, 2021. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and we're here to give you a wonderful insight as to how you deal with people, particularly people, you phone them up and you find out that they are in the hospital. Maybe it's a sickness or maybe it's because of an accident. So you decide to go and visit them, but you're not really sure what to say. And so you often say the prayer our Lord taught us, our Father who art in heaven. But there is another way. And I'm going to talk about that on this program. What I do, and this is happening to me this week, in our church, one of the four that I'm helping out with, there was a lady who had to be flown to the Decatur Hospital in Illinois because of a serious situation. I got a hold of the husband and he said they were going to be doing some tests. And by God's grace, she seems to be improving. And we're going to be going to see her on Thursday. So what am I going to do when I go see her? My practice is to take the Bible with me and then find a psalm that would be suitable for her. Now, we all have favorite psalms, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and others, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But what I do is I just kind of open up the book of Psalms and point to a page. And whatever that page is, that's the psalm I'm going to use. Now, how can I be so confident that these psalms are going to be helpful. Well, the one that I have chosen for this coming week when I visit with her is Psalm 32. Just open up Psalm, and there was Psalm 32. Now, you'll notice a couple of things with the Psalms. First of all, there's always a message of law and gospel. Law is that we have committed sin. The gospel is that God has forgiven that sin. And you don't have to go very far in Psalm 32 to discover that. Listen to the first verse. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, we're going to look at what transgression forgiven means, but where does this idea come from about whose sin is covered? If you'll recall, the first sin of humanity was that of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And when they realized that they were naked, they attempted to put together some leaves from trees to cover themselves. And of course, they weren't working in the hot sun. So what God did, he provided them with the skin of animals and covered their sin. That is really important. And what transgression is forgiven is explained in the next verse. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, what kind of human being is that? Because I thought all of us commit iniquity and we have sinful spirits where there is deceit. But what this psalm is talking about is a believer. The Lord counts no iniquity against him. See, that's what the word forgiven means. You are no longer held accountable 
for your sin. Now, that's not found in any other religion of the world, but it is found in Scripture. So, why does the Lord no longer count iniquity against you? Because Jesus on the cross took upon himself the punishment of all of your iniquity. And so believers in Christ are believers in which there is no deceit. And guess what? The Lord counts no iniquity against them. Verse 3, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. You see, at times we all do sinful actions and we're silent. We don't want to tell God about them because we're afraid he might not let us go to heaven. And so we just groan about these sins all day long. And verse 4 tells us what happens. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. See, that's what happens to those who refuse to acknowledge their sins to God. Their strength will be dried up like the heat of summer, and God's hand is too heavy upon them. So, what does he do in verse 5? I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. Now, what does that mean? How do people cover their iniquity? Well, you find them having done a sin, and then they blame someone else for putting them in that situation. And therefore, you are saying to them, you're the result of my doing that sin. So verse 5 continues, once he realizes, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I did not blame someone else. I took full responsibility for my sin. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, the word Lord in the English has all capital letters. And it reminds us of Jesus at Mount Sinai, the angel of the Lord that Moses was talking to. And Jesus was there and forgiving the iniquity of all of our sin. So, verse 6. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Now, when can we offer prayer to God? At a time when he may be found. Well, it's explained in verse 6. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Now, I'm going to bring up a point here why the Psalms are so important. It's not that the only prayer that Jesus did was a few in the New Testament, such as the Lord's Prayer, the High Priestly Prayer. All the Psalms are prayers of Jesus. Now, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. He says he'll confess my transgressions to the Lord. He had no transgressions. But what God had done is declared him to be a sinner for the whole world. And therefore, he confessed those transgressions of you and me and paid the price. Therefore, that is what is meant, that you pray to him at a time when he may be found and you are able to reach him. There's never an occasion where you cannot reach God because he is omnipresent. 
So getting back to verse 7, remember Jesus is praying this. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Jesus is talking about himself because when he went up on the mountain to pray to the Father, that was a hiding place for him. And God preserved him from trouble and was surrounded with shouts of deliverance. Now you say, wait a minute, wasn't he crucified? He wasn't delivered from that. Well, if you take a look though, he made a promise that yes, he would be crucified for you, but on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. And so therefore, from Jesus' point of view, God is very faithful, the Father, and he is going to deliver Jesus, which he did. Remember the words of the cross at the end? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And Jesus in the spirit went directly to heaven on that good Friday. Verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eyes upon you. Now, this is Jesus talking to us. What does it mean that his eyes are upon us? It means he's taking a look at our circumstances and he's making a promise, Romans 8, 28, that all things are going to work together for our good. Or 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation will come to you beyond your power to resist. But with a temptation, you will have a way of escape. That's how God the Father is a hiding place for each of us. And that's because Jesus instructs us and teaches us in the way we ought to go. And he will counsel us with my eye upon you. Now, sometimes Jesus does not have his eye upon people. And those are unbelievers, individuals who no longer believe in him, individuals who really don't care about his promises. But the Christian, regardless of what you are experiencing, his eye is upon you. Uh, we saw that in a gospel reading where the disciples are in a boat and it's filling up with water. So they wake Jesus up. We are perishing. Save us. And Jesus says, where is your faith? And that means, where is your trust in my promises? I said to you, I will not die in the waters. I will die on the cross. But I also will be raised from the dead three days later. So Jesus is our teacher, teaching us always not only that he keeps his eye on you, but we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. Verse 9, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, because they must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. Yes, bridles were used so that they could direct the horse or the mule, maybe to pull the plow. And apart from that bridle and bit, well, the horse would just go walking off by itself. Jesus says, don't be like that horse or mule without understanding. Now, it's somewhat interesting to note that the disciples did not understand many of the miracles of Jesus. 
Uh, for example, the feeding of the 5,000. They joined with the other crew thinking, oh, he's a bread king. And Jesus corrected them two chapters later. No, he's God himself. In the same way that God supplied manna to Israel and Moses, so Jesus supplies bread and fish to the people. And he did not only do that with Jews, 5,000 of them, but also with Gentiles, 4,000 of them. So there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Now, verse 10 gets back to the law. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is saying that the wicked have many sorrows for a very simple reason, that they are not listening to Jesus. They are not following what he has to say. But those who have steadfast love and trust in the Lord, yes, you're still going to have sorrows, but they will not be as difficult as those of the wicked. And why is that? Verse 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Now, this psalm ends on a note that is very important when we're talking about the gospel. And that is that what God has done in Christ, Jesus is your righteousness because he never sinned all the way through the cross. And what he does, he takes that righteousness that he won and applies it to you through faith in him. Now you can take a look at individuals who also God used to write these Psalms. I do believe that these are prayers of Jesus, but like the rest of the Bible, he used prophets and apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit to say what was necessary. David, who wrote some of these Psalms, in fact, this one begins, a mascal of David. And that means a musical or liturgical poem. David, though, he though was a great king of Israel, he also sinned greatly. At first, he also tried to keep his sin a secret. But then we see how David felt when he tried to hide it. He felt awful. And therefore, maybe you also are in the same way thinking awful when all you do is need to read verse 5. I acknowledge my sins to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That phraseology is actually a part of our liturgy, and they're the words of Jesus. David finally confessed to God, and now instead he felt very blessed because David knew God had forgiven him. You know, they say confession is good for the soul, for when we confess, we can remember again that God has forgiven us because of the death of Jesus. David says it's a great blessing to have our sins covered. Now, there was somebody who wrote this. Next to your bed, set a hat 
and it can be a hat with a brim on it. And then every night before you go to sleep, confess your sins to God in prayer. Then lift up the hat, pretend to put your sins under it, and set it down again. Remember that your sins are covered because of Jesus. And that covering took place in the Garden of Eden when poor Adam and Eve had really nothing except a bunch of leaves, and God gave them skins of animals. And that kind of showed or pointed forward that there needed to be blood shed for sins to be forgiven. No human being is so perfect that were he to die on the cross, he could not possibly forgive the sins of anybody else because he has his own sins. So Jesus became a human being in order to suffer and die for you. And as you trust in Jesus for what he did, the Bible makes clear that the gift he gives you is his righteousness. It's not that you're righteous because you no longer sin. It's not that you're righteous because you're doing wonderful good works. No, you're righteous because God has declared you to be righteous. And that is a wonderful message to give to anyone in a hospital who may be very ill and needs to hear that message. You see, the entire Bible is all about law and gospel. God definitely talks about our sins and what happens when we keep them to ourselves and don't confess them. But he also speaks about what happens when we confess them before God and that we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, so that heaven is our home. In fact, I would challenge you after this program or sometime today to pick up a Bible, just turn to the section on Psalms and just flip it open and put your finger down on any Psalm. And I guarantee you, the Psalm will be a prayer about Jesus, from Jesus, and a prayer for you. And in that prayer, you will find the comfort of the Christian gospel, that yes, we sin, but as we confess our sins, God is faithful and will not hold us accountable for our sins. Tell me another religion that teaches that. That's why every religion is not the same. And that's why Christianity stands far and above all else as we proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, who died so that we will never really die, and who lives and lives eternally. Tomorrow with Wes Reimnitz, we'll take a look at another subject that should be of interest to you, so tune us in at 9.30. I'm Tom Baker. God bless you.
Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check payable to Concordia Mission Society and mail it to Tom Baker, P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132. To give online, visit lawandgospel101.com or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.